in order to be successful yes. with learning how to write equations for redox reactions. You have to learn the rules which underlie the development and derivation of half reactions. As we have told you, the method we will employ to get at net redox reaction equations is by the so-called half reaction method. We talked last time extensively about the table of half reactions in chapter 22, table number two. Today we'll do some fundamental demonstrations which illustrate how a table like that can be, can be constructed. You will look in detail at considerations regarding the derivation of half reactions tomorrow in discussion class. Be there. And if you want to get the most from tomorrow's conversation, do this first. And you know about this. Do this tomorrow. Now then, one thing I left out last time regarding the zinc copper ion electrolytic system which we looked at by demonstration where we found out that zinc is spontaneously oxidized by hydrated copper ion or if you wish to say zinc spontaneously reduces hydrated copper ion becoming hydrated zinc ion and copper metal as products it is standard practice to express or refer to an electrolysis, pardon me, an electrolytic cell by expressing it in what is known as standard cell notation. So for the electrolytic cell we looked at last time, zinc bar sticking in a solution of zinc ion, the anode half cell, copper bar, copper strip sticking in a solution of copper ion, specifically one molar zinc sulfate solution and one molar copper sulfate solution, although I think last time we had half molar copper sulfate solution. And then interconnecting these two cell, half cells, the anodic half cell where zinc gets oxidized, the cathodic half cell where hydrated copper ion gets reduced to copper, connecting these two half cells with an external circuit so we can use the electricity delivered by this process as zinc atoms give electrons to copper ions. We want to use that electricity to power something. What we did last time was to power a voltmeter so you could read the standard electrochemical potential for that system. Well, it wasn't standard electrochemical potential because the copper ion wasn't at one molar, it was at half molar. And then completing the connection, completing the circuit with a salt bridge. So here is that system written in standard cell notation. The standard practice is to write the hand note at the left because it is standard practice in drawing a picture of an electrochemical cell, a voltaic cell, which we did last time, with the anode system on the left. So in standard cell notation we start with the anode system on the left. Zinc was the anode material. The vertical single line is a phase separator because this is zinc solid. The zinc solid was standing in the zinc ion containing solution, liquid phase. You can put sulfate ion in here as well, but I choose not to because that's not part of the chemistry of the system. So, zinc, the anode material getting oxidized to hydrated zinc ion. The double vertical line is representative of whatever device we use to interconnect the half cells. For our case, that was a salt bridge. Copper ion the species which gets reduced. In this case it was hydrated copper ion. So that's what we've written here as a component of the cathodic half cell. Vertical separator because copper ion changed phase as it became copper solid and copper solid was also the cathode material. As you will see we could use different materials as the cathode rather than copper, but for the cell we 
demonstrated last time we did use copper metal. More on using other materials as cathode materials later on. Now, on with our redox demonstration, which relates to this. The purpose of the redox demonstration I've here written. We want to develop half-reaction equations, and after we develop these half-reaction equations, we're going to make a table. The table will look just like table two, except that it'll be a much shorter table. Just like table two, we'll write the formula or formulas for the materials which function as the reducer on the left side, on the left side of the reaction arrow. And then in the right side column, the products of this half reaction, we'll write the formula for the material or materials which are produced by this reducer, whatever it is, getting oxidized. So just like table two, the reducers will be written in order of increasing strength from bottom to top. The strongest reducer in the table we construct will be at the top. Therefore, just like with the acid base table, where the acids are getting stronger from bottom to top, and the bases therefore must get stronger from top to bottom, same for this reducer conjugate oxidizer table. just like table 2 in chapter 22. The oxidizers will be getting stronger from top to bottom because the strongest reducer will oxidize to the weakest oxidizer. The conjugate oxidizer of the strongest reducer will be the weakest oxidizer in the table we construct. And when we get to the bottom of the reducer column, We'll have the formula or formulas for the weakest reducer for which the conjugate oxidizer or oxidizer will be the strongest in this table which we construct. And after we write this table, we'll ask questions like predicting outcome of reactions. And if we answer this question, you'll realize how to answer the same question for the table in the notes, the much more extensive table. How many redox reactions can have their outcome successfully predicted by such a table? Another question. This production of hydrogen gas by redox. depend on pH. We'll be able to answer that question with the half reactions we develop. And some other questions which I'll probably think of as we proceed. Here are the experiments we're going to do. Only seven. Sodium in water, zinc in water. Zinc in sulfuric acid solution. One molar. 
copper and sulfuric acid solution one molar. Copper and nine molar sulfuric acid solution one molar. Would you expect that if sulfuric acid solution can function as an oxidizer or an oxidizing system, that nine molar sulfuric would be a stronger oxidizing system than one molar? Experiment six, copper and six molar nitric acid solution. Experiment seven, copper and six molar sodium nitrate solution. That's it. Now, notice that for some of these experiments, I've added this notation. Experiment two, experiment four, experiment five, experiment seven. The outcome of these investigations will be no reaction. So I think it's simpler to tell you straight away that these experiments will lead to no reaction rather than our putting together these systems and standing there and waiting 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 and, waiting and find out that we get no reaction. Now then, on we go. First with an investigation, the likes of which you should be familiar because we did this when we started chapter 20 on fundamental thermodynamics. I've got here some deionized water, a sizable collection so that I can reach the deionized water level with the probes on this very elegant conductivity meter. A light bulb to which electrodes are, are attached. Power source. This thing stand, the light bulb does not glow. But notice if I bridge the leads of the electrodes connected to the light bulb, the light bulb glows brightly. Because as you know, metals are good conductors, so I'm now using the business end of this screwdriver metal, principally iron, to function as a electrode bridge so we can get current flow to show you that when we bridge the leads on the electrodes we will get current to flow. Now then, I will carefully immerse the tips of the electrodes into our deionized water. For this investigation we're also going to use some phenylthaline so I'll add some phenylthaline now. You may recall we used phenylthaline for this investigation previously. You can see that the phenylthaline develops no color. Perhaps you recall that phenylthaline does not show any conversion from colorless to a definite red-pink color until we get pHs above 9. Well, we got deionized water in there. pH is on the order of 6 to 6.5. So we're not surprised that the phenylthalene treated solution still remains colorless. And we're also not surprised to see we get no light bulb glow because even though we know there's an ion concentration in the ionized water, total ion concentration of 2 times 10 to the minus 7 molar, that's too small an ion concentration to support any measurable current flow, any measurable travel of ions between the electrodes with this very elegant conductivity measuring or observing device. Now just for the moment while we do the chemistry, I'll remove the power source just in case I inadvertently bridge the electrodes with me. I don't want to find out how good a conductor I am and expose you to the possible result of searing flesh. My flesh. Just as we did last time, I've got some sodium chunks pre-cut under kerosene. I want the biggest chunk because that always gives the most dramatic result. I got it on Kim White. I want to mop off the kerosene because I don't want that to be part of our investigation.
The sodium metal, as you see it here, is not shiny at all. But if I were to make a fresh slice on the sodium so you'd see the sodium metal, it'd be a very bright silvery color. But in short order fashion, it would tarnish. Because what you're really looking at here is a coat of sodium oxide. That's not particularly dull, because sodium is such a potent reducer that as soon as you express it, exp expose it to oxygen in the atmosphere, you form this sodium oxide coat. Well, let's get on with the investigation. Clear my path for escape. I'll go over here. Again, as we did last time, we see a vigorous reaction. You may notice that the surface, I mean, that the sodium swims about on the surface of the water because it's less dense than water. Starting to get some sparks. Reaction is quite exothermic. It may ignite, perhaps not. The sodium assumes a spherical shape because its melting point is quite low and the exo nature of this reaction is sufficient to melt the sodium, turn it into a little molten lump of sodium swimming around on the surface of the water. Still a little bit of sodium swimming in there. I'll wait till the swimming activity is finished to allow the sodium to complete its Olympic trials. Still some in there. Still a little tiny bit. No explosions, I'm sorry. You might recall I told you that in World War I, one attempt the Allies made at construction of depth charges to get to German U-boats was sodium-filled metal chambers. The trouble with the sodium concussion is that it goes pretty much straight up. So if you didn't time the dropping of the depth charge just right so that the U-boat swam right over the concussion, concussion you missed. So the, the Allies went back and developed better depth charges which went three-dimensional rather than pretty much straight up. All right, we ran a reaction, which of course created a basic system. That's why the phenylthalene changed color. The sodium dissolved during this reaction, and I think we can all agree that we saw gas produced by this reaction. Let's see if we can get... Some light bulb glow this time. There we go. Because we ran a reaction which did what? Produced what? Ions. It had to produce ions because those are the species which transport electrical current in solution. Aqueous solution. All right. Now then. I'll turn off the light bulb. What decisions can we make about the half reactions which took place when we ran this redox reaction? Well, first we'll take advantage of something we learned in 2045. The 1A metals, of which sodium is a member. The only chemistry which they show when they react is to lose one electron per atom. So there's a half reaction. It shows the conversion of sodium to sodium ion. We looked at this half reaction at the start of our conversation on chapter 22. Now, to develop the other half reaction, we can start with this. Because this half reaction shows us that the ion which is produced is positive. 
and sodium and water are each neutral materials. Consequently, we know for a fact that at least one or more other ions, at least one other ion produced by this redox reaction has got to be an anion. Because we start with neutral species, we made a positive ion, positive ions, a bunch of sodium ions, so we had to make negative ions. We also saw the production of a gas, and we also know that as sodium proceeded to become sodium ion by loss of electrons, the electrons had to be consumed by water because the only two components of this system, as our principal species inventory shows us, sodium and water initially. So water had to collect the electrons. Question one. What ion, negative ion, is obviously derivable from water and which can account for a system being chemically basic? Hydroxide ion. Question two. What gas or gases are obviously derivable from water? Hydrogen, oxygen, both. You might recall last time that the gas produced by the reaction burst in the flame. So associated with that, even though we didn't get much flame at all this time, we asked the question which we asked last time. Hydrogen, oxygen. Are these gases each flammable? What do you think? Or is it true that only one of these gases is flammable? What is that? Only oxygen. Only oxygen what? Nope. Only hydrogen is flammable. Oxygen is a combustion supporter, but oxygen itself is not combustible. But hydrogen, if heated strongly in the presence of oxygen, or perhaps you'd like me to make another mixture of hydrogen with oxygen and I can put it over the burner and we'll get the nice boom. Or we can have the, we can reconstruct the dirigible Hindenburg and fly it in the power lines. <laughs> or we can take advantage of another thing we already talked about on day one regarding chapter 22. Regarding this half reaction, which shows reduction of water. What's the oxidation state of hydrogen in the water molecule? Plus one of oxygen in the water molecule. Remember this game? Oxidation numbers for hydrogen and oxygen respectively. Oxidation number, oxidation state for atoms in an element. This is a half reaction which corresponds to electron consumption. Can I go from minus two oxidation state oxygen to zero oxidation state oxygen? By collecting electrons which are negative? No. I don't think so. But I can go from plus one hydrogen to zero hydrogen by collecting electrons. So with this simple gadget of oxidation number analysis, we can recognize that for this half reaction, the product is hydrogen exclusively. Now we would verify that by experiment, by trapping some of the gas and doing some analysis thereupon, which would verify that it's hydrogen exclusively. 
So now we have a skeleton. Do you recall that a skeleton is a statement which is resembling an equation, but it is not an equation if it doesn't balance. What do we do to turn this into an equation? Well, we can start by simple analysis, arithmetic analysis, and recognize that as things stand in a water molecule on an atomic basis, I got two hydrogen atoms. Products, hydroxide, ion, and hydrogen, three hydrogen atoms. So let's double up the number of hydrogen atoms. How would I now establish material equality for hydrogen atoms? And at the same time, establish material equality for oxygen atoms. Multiply this one by two. And now I can see at a glance, I have material balance. What requiring, what remaining requirement must be met to turn this into an equation? Establish charge balance. So all I need to do is to see that as things stand, on the left, no charge. On the right, two moles of minus. That does it. So, I now have two half reactions, which I can put in my table. And in order to make the table systematic and organized, like table two in the notes, because table two in the notes has all the reducers on the left and all the conjugate oxidizers of these reducers on the right, on the right of the reaction arrow. So I'm going to take this half reaction and turn it around in order to add it to the table. And I will realize that as I add these half reactions to this table, this function as the reducer, this is the stuff that got oxidized. This function as the oxidizer, this is the stuff that got reduced. So when I write this half reaction in the other direction, to show the combo of hydrogen and hydroxide ion as a reducing system, for which the oxidation product is water. Can I say for a fact that hydroxide ion and hydrogen as a reducing system is a weaker reducer than sodium? Do you think this will ever come to equilibrium? Do you think that as long as sodium is in contact with water, this reaction will ever shut down? That tells me that sodium is a much stronger reducer than the combo of hydroxide, iodine, and hydrogen. So here we go. We start the table. Now, I've written here that another experiment, which we could do and stand and stand and wait and see that nothing happens, is the placement of zinc in water. That tells me, if sodium readily clobbers water, as we just saw, and zinc does nothing to water, which is the stronger reducer, sodium or zinc? Sodium. So the zinc becoming hydrated zinc ion has got to be a half reaction which is underneath this. Does it also have to be underneath this? If zinc is not capable of reducing water, if zinc as a reducer does not reduce water to become hydrated zinc ion, does it follow that? Hydrated zinc ion will be readily reduced by hydroxide ion and hydrogen. Just like an acid base table. If I compare the strengths of reducer A to reducer B, 
which means at the same time I'm comparing the strengths of the conjugate oxidizer of reducer A and the conjugate oxidizer of reducer B. If reducer A cannot reduce the conjugate oxidizer of reducer B, then it must be true that reducer B is a stronger reducer than reducer A and will reduce the conjugate oxidizer of reducer A. Just like the acid base table. If acid A is stronger than acid B, if acid A is stronger than acid B, the conjugate base of acid B compares how strength Y to the conjugate base of acid A. If conjugate oxidizer of B is not reduced by reducer A, then it must be true that reducer B can reduce the conjugate oxidizer of reducer A. Bunch of language to get it all To get at this information, that if this can't reduce this to become this, then it must be true that this combo of materials can reduce this. That's what we just said, even though we used a hell of a lot of words to say it. Now, let's try another investigation. Here I've got zinc in a beaker, and I'm going to add some one molar sulfuric acid. While I do this, please inventory for PSI, one molar sulfuric acid. I trust you got that. Back to chapter 18. Let's see what we got. Anything going on in here? What's going on? It's dissolving. It is dissolving. <laughs> what is it? The zinc solid. It's, but it's also producing something. Producing something. Yes. Give me a better description of something. It appears to be a milky white uh, product. Milky white product. Yeah. Hmm. A spurious observation. <laughs> Tell me, do you see anything happening on the surface of the metal? What do you see? Bubbles. Bubbles. You concur? A gas is being liberated on the surface of the metal. Yes. Now our first observer reported that the zinc is dissolving. This is correct. But he must have elegant observational powers because it's hard to see something disappear. <laughs> but if we let the zinc stand in there for a good while, we would find out. That as long as the hydronium concentration remained fairly high, the zinc would continue to dissolve by this redox process as a gas is being liberated. Now I'm going to shut this down. Rinse my zinc strip.
recognize that for the redox reaction we just took a look at, zinc and sulfuric acid solution, resulting in vigorous bubbling on the surface of the zinc, as the zinc progressively disappears, goes in the solution. And we've already got the half reaction for that process on the board. There it is. Now, tell me, since we've got the PSI for sulfuric acid solution on the board, what's oxidizing zinc? Do you think it's fair immediately to rule out water? Because we recognize that zinc and water doesn't do anything. So two choices remain. Now notice, one of our questions said, does production of hydrogen by redox depend on pH? So I'm going to ask this question. If we know in this redox reaction, the one we just looked at, that zinc is being oxidized to hydrated zinc ion, and the oxidizer is either hydronium ion or hydrogen sulfate ion, or maybe both. What's the gas? Because the gas has got to be derived from one or both of these materials. What do you think the gas is? Hydrogen. Why do you think it's hydrogen? Well, if we're going to derive the gas from hydronium ion, it's rather like deriving a gas from water, wouldn't you say? You're going to get hydrogen or oxygen. And we've already recognized that you do not produce oxygen by reduction. You produce hydrogen by reduction. So look at this question. Does production of H2 by redox depend on pH? Can we answer that question now? Can we now answer that question? Zinc in deionized water, what's the pH? What's the pH? 7.0. One molar sulfuric acid solution. What's the pH, the one significant figure? 0. 0.2. 0. In the 0, 0.0 system, we got vigorous evolution of a gas. In the 7.0 system, we got no gas evolution, we got no reaction. And if we capture some of this gas, we'll find out that it is hydrogen. If we capture the gas and analyze it, we'll find out that it's hydrogen. Does production of hydrogen by redox depend on pH? Did we produce any hydrogen with, water, with zinc standing in pH 7 water? No. Well, zinc just stood in pH 0 water. Did we get a reaction? A vigorous reaction, liberating a gas. So does production of hydrogen by redox depend on pH? Yes. You're damn right. So if we recognize that production of hydrogen depends on pH, what do you think is being reduced to give us the hydrogen? This or this, because these are all either either of these are potential hydrogen sources. Which one? Which is the better hydrogen giver? Do you realize? that when I gave this electrons, which sodium was capable of doing, and creating hydrogen, that what I did from an oxidation number analysis standpoint is to give hydrogens to plus one oxidations, to give electrons, pardon me, to plus one oxidation state hydrogens. Okay so far? Well, which of these is the better source of plus one oxidation state hydrogens? This or this? Which is the better acid? Hydronium ion. And when, when acids do their thing, do they not give away plus one oxidation state hydrogens? 
How about that? Because what you're going to realize, if you have not done any of this yet, is when you learn these rules, just about every one of them depends, yes, on what, on what kind of chemistry? Acid-base chemistry. How about that? So here we are, chapter 18 all over again. Plus a number of these half reactions which we're going to look at depend on formation of precipitates. Chapter 19, they also involve formation or destruction of complex ions or conversion of one complex ion to a different complex ion or conversion of a complex ion to a precipitate or vice versa. So all the stuff we've done before, here it is all over again. So we'll stop at this point. Wait, let me add one more. Let's, let's develop one more half reaction, then we'll stop. Here's what we've got so far. Hydronium ion collects the electrons, in this case in the redox reaction with zinc. And one of the reduction products is hydrogen. Clearly, we've got to have another product over here, because as yet, we don't have anything which contains oxygen. Question, is it possible to make a hydrogen molecule from a hydronium ion? Is it possible to make a hydrogen molecule from a hydronium ion? Is it possible? You're damn right it's possible because I need two hydrogen atoms to make a hydrogen molecule and this has got three hydrogen atoms. Now, is it chemically feasible to make a hydrogen molecule from one hydronium ion? Why not? Here's our hydronium ion. I need a clobber two plus one oxidation state hydrogens to give me two hydrogen atoms to make my hydrogen molecule. Is that alright? Can I get both of these plus one oxidation state hydrogens from a single hydronium ion? Because if I take away one H plus from a hydronium ion, what have I got left? Water. Does zinc reduce water? No. So I need two of these to do the job. And if I recognize that by subtracting plus one oxidation state hydrogen from hydronium ion I make water, I recognize what the other product is of this reaction. The only remaining thing is to balance electricity. What do I write in front of electrons? Two. And now I can put this in my table. And we'll pause and ask, ask this question right now. We've only got four half reactions. We're going to finish next time and develop the remaining three. I mean, we're going to develop three remaining half reactions. But with the four we have now, how many redox reactions can have their outcomes successfully predicted? With this table, only four half reactions. Discounting reaction of a given reducer with itself. How many redox reactions can we now predict outcome successfully? Thermodynamically. How many? I heard a vote for 16. Now I heard a vote for 12 is right. This, with this, this, and this. This, with this, this. This with this, this, and this. This with this, this, and this. Now, maybe this with this, this, and this. And this with this, this, and this. That's four times three. You can do the counting. Twelve is right. Take a look now at table number two in the notes. And see how many half reactions you can predict success. I mean, how many redox reactions you can predict successfully outcome-wise with that table. And we'll pick it up from this point next time.